Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, during the successive sessions this week, we reviewed the challenges besetting Africa, and these have to do with inadequate infrastructure of quality accessible to all, accelerated industrialization that is environmentally friendly and drawn by agricultural value chains that are promising and resilient. We also, we also discussed the debt burden and the shortfalls of energy to all Africans while ensuring strong economic growth that is green, inclusive and sustainable in an integrated region. Of course, you would ask me the question, how to reconcile all these parameters? Economic growth depends on accumulation of human capital flowing from subsequent uh, investment in the area of health, education, and uh, uh, skills building and innovation in order to generate uh, African youth that is uh, able to cope with the present and future challenges of our society. Statistics show that rate of uh, investment on uh, schooling and impact on uh, as I was saying, in Africa, each dollar invested in reducing chronic malnutrition among children would yield $16. Investment in the production of uh, labor would feed decent uh, job and lead to substantial poverty reduction. To take advantage of the demographic uh, dividend, investment in human capital is more than necessary. As you know, analysis of the trends of growth in Africa show that uh, the measure of economic performance through GDP growth is not enough. After more than a decade of growth without jobs, as you know, the average elasticity of employment in many African countries remains weak, 0.41% over the period 2000-2014. This reflects, of course, the lack of growth of employment and productivity. Investment in human capital is therefore a prerequisite for Africans to actively participate in growth through employment and innovation in order to contribute towards the structural transformation of our economies on the one hand and to equitably benefit from the fruits of growth on the other hand. However, in a world that is ever changing where uncertainty is calling into question the challenges of our projections, uh, the most solid projections of our governments and major institutions in the world, and the frequency of scourges and instability. What can we do to ensure that Africans access employment and opportunity and basic social services of quality? Against a background where climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic have plunged uh, many of our countries in an unprecedented economic crisis with a very high um, birth rate of about 2.7% and unemployment rate among youths that is more than 12.7% according to ILO figures of 2022, with more than one out of five young persons in Africa not in employment, in education or in training according to 2020 figures, and a timid economic uh, rebound flowing from the effects of the Ukrainian crisis. What can we do to ensure that Africa's human capital is resilient and uh, ensure that the continent can solidly rely on its resources to build uh, a vibrant socioeconomic transformation? It's on the basis of these issues that this session is going to draw from evidence to uh, resolve 
all these questions, mindful of the impact of the recession and widening inequalities and its impact on employment, on the youth and the demographic dividend and the issues relating to informality and social inclusion of uh, women and the most vulnerable. Against this background, we are also going to consider the catalytic role of uh, the digital revolution in accelerating socioeconomic progress and in ensuring inclusive access to opportunities, as well as ensuring that when it is not properly planified, this, poten this potential, this will lead to potential harmful effects and amplifying inequalities, especially in the area of training, uh, income, uh, while ensuring that in times of crisis, uh, categories like uh, the most vulnerable will be more affected. That is why in this session, we shall look at these issues of lack of opportunities among the youth as a source of fragility and an obstacle to the resilience of Africa, which we must build. Accordingly, it is necessary to prioritize human and social investments that are transforming while laying emphasis on resolution through three levers. One, sustainable investment in human capital to shape the future of employment and to foster equitable access to opportunities of income. Two, from sustaining the establishment of so so social protection systems that are inclusive and sustainable to reduce fragility and informality and to promote technological innovation in the training of human capital in order to better prepare our societies to the current and future contingencies. I thank you for your kind attention. On that note, I will now invite our key speaker, Mr. David Huismans. But before that, may I introduce Mr. David Huisman, who is currently working as a on uh, issues of youth within the ILO regional office in Africa. He's also jointly managing a program with the African Development Bank on employment markers, that is job markers. And we've already prepared the concept note and this is being implemented jointly between ILO and uh, African Development Bank. He is a seasoned officer on transformation, on governance, on youth empowerment. And he has over 15 years of professional experience, international experience, both working with uh, development partners in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe. He's a holder of two masters and uh, a postgraduate uh, higher education diploma in uh, developmental issues. Without any further ado, Mr. David Huisman, we will give you the floor to discuss with us the impact of the recession and widening inequalities on employment, youth, and demographic dividend in Africa. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. So, Excellencies, dear colleagues from the African Development Bank, ladies and gentlemen, my keynote speech of today is on the impact of the recession and on the inequality gap on job, youth, and Africa's democratic dividend. Unfortunately, many countries are already in the middle of economic turmoil, and numerous economic forecasts very worrying and alarming outlooks. But since my speech is part of the evaluation week, I would like to refrain from predictions. Rather, I will focus first on what we have noticed and learned so far on the impact of the multiple global crises that African young people are facing and have been facing on their labor market prospects and on the inequality gap. And secondly, I will offer four key thoughts on what I believe we should be doing to empower African youth and to maximize employment impact. These four recommendations, and I will get back to them, are firstly, invest into statistics and data collection for evidence-based policy and decision-making. Secondly, formulate and deliver inclusive policies and pro-employment framework 
with and for youth. Thirdly, put decent job creation systematically at the forefront of all programs, policies, and investment in Africa. And last but not least, implement and accelerate a transformative agenda for structural economic change and for addressing growing inequalities. Based on honest assessment and evaluation of what has worked or not, and above all, on endogenous pathways to sustainable development in Africa. Certain sectors, as you all know, and democratic groups have been hit hard by the COVID crisis. Among them are women, youth, migrant workers, along with SMEs and many, many workers in the informal economy. According to the 2022 ILO flagship report, World Employment and Social Outlook, the pandemic has reversed some of the progress in poverty reduction achieved in the last decades. The recent GDP is estimated to have declined by 1.9% in 2020, with significant differences across sub-regions and countries in Africa. As a whole in Africa, the pandemic is estimated to have resulted in a deficit of 15 million jobs. 15 million jobs either lost directly or not created because of a lack of economic growth. And these jobs losses are only, sadly, the tip of the iceberg. Labor underutilization has increased, as well as working poverty while income declined. The most recent ILO estimate show that in 2020, nearly 5 million additional workers and their household fell below the extreme poverty line. Increasing the extreme poverty rate for the first time since 2020 by 1.3 percent uh, percentage point from uh, 2019 to 2020. In terms of the specific impact on young African men and women, young people in Africa have had to face the consequences of the setbacks of the global economy. In 2020, again, over one in five young African people were not in employment, education, or training. It means that one among five young Africans are at risk of becoming socially excluded. In 2020, in Northern Africa, for example, it was estimated that the percentage of young people who were not in employment, education, or training was at 29.1%. That is the equivalent of nearly 12 million young men and women. And at 21.8% in Sub-Sahara Africa, representing 47, over 47 million young men and women. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has put significant social economic pressure on the region. We strongly felt impact of global and local lockdowns, value chain disruptions, and widespread economic downturn. In Sub-Sahara Africa, for example, the COVID crisis resulted in working hour losses equivalent to 13.5 million full-time jobs. And women, unfortunately, accounted for the lion's chairs of these net job losses in the regions. Young women were particularly hit by the COVID-19 crisis induced job losses, in part because of their overrepresentation in sectors that were most affected, including in the informal economy, and in part also because women, including young women, still carry the brunt of unpaid care work and in many cases had to abandon income opportunities to look after the family members. The just published 2022 ILO Global Employment Trend for Youth in Africa reports helps to shed lights or further light on youth labor market in the regions. Youth employment rate range from almost 30% in Northern Africa, where almost every other woman in the labor force is unemployed, down to 11% in Sub-Saharan Africa. One important point I would like to stress here, because you may have picked on this 11% in Sub-Saharan Africa, is that youth employment is not that, you may have picked that youth employment is not that high. 
only that 11%. However, youth employment and labor underutilization are not the biggest challenge for young people in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, many young people simply cannot afford to be unemployed and therefore need to engage into any income generating activities. These jobs, in almost all cases, take place in the informal economy, do not come with any social protection, are often insecure, at time and safe, and in many cases, do not offer young women and men personal growth opportunities. Addressing the youth employment challenge in Africa is just first and foremost about dealing with a deep-rooted crisis of job quality. In terms of inequality, we have very sadly observed growing income and gender inequality in the region. And the pre-pandemic economic growth has not significantly helped to reduce social and economic inequalities. Africa with Latin America remain the two most unequal regions in the world. And both regions have the largest proportion of country with relatively high level of income inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. According to the 2021 ILO flagship report, Inequality and the World of Work, different forms of inequality coexist, including virtual, vertical inequality be between rich and poor and horizontal inequalities between different groups in societies. And these inequalities have generally been on the increase or remain high towards even very high in many countries across the continent. The pandemic has just clearly aggravated the existing vulnerability of young people in labor market. And to put it very bluntly to you, Africa's growth and employment patterns have not created enough productive employment opportunities. Besides, inequality have been exacerbated by the ongoing crisis and the inequality gap is deepening. As the labor force continues to grow at a rapid rate in Africa, these challenges will become even more pressing. Young people will likely be the most effective affected, sorry, by the long-term consequence of the crisis. But the overall impact is not yet fully known, due at least partially to substantial data challenge that we see on a daily basis. As I see it, this data challenge is twofold. Firstly, Africa is the youngest continent, yet the definition of youth is stretched in some countries up to 35 years of age. Secondly, Data is often lacking or outdated in many African countries, and it just prevents government and development partners to take stock of the current situation in terms of employment and to estimate what has worked or not worked. This needs to change, and substantial investment should be made to harmonize definition, to collect regularly data in order to inform decision making and to formulate holistic pro-employment policies, notably for young African women and men. Ultimately, and to guarantee social cohesion, governments in Africa need to ensure that youth constitute a key resource for the continent and not a source of instability. And we, as ILO and development partners, we need to go all in decent job creation in Africa. Despite these troubling trends, there is also cause for optimism. Young people have been, and certainly are, an energetic, an energetic force at the forefront of developing creative solutions. We should therefore look at young people as part of the solution and not as part of the problem. Or better say, in the future, to rely much more on young people to tackle these challenges of employment. That means that young African men and women need to play an active role in shaping their future. And we, as development partners, bank evaluation professionals and policymakers, we have a moral obligation to support this enabling environment 
and to guarantee them these opportunities. Why strengthening resilience, providing anti-fragility measures, and financing new specific initiative to boost entrepreneurship or and to upscale their skills in the digital economy. Too often, young people feel trapped in a system which was created for them by all older and other generation. Clearly, the pathway for them to thrive, it, to thrive in needs to be formulated with them as opposed to for them. A good example of this is the joint ILO, ITU and African Union program on boosting decent job and enhancing skills for youth in Africa's digital economy, where we are establishing a youth advisory group on digital jobs. And I take this opportunity here to invite every young participants of this event to apply before the deadline on the 9th of October on our ILO website. A third recommendation, at least as critical as the previous one, is for African governments, international and regional financial institutions, and development partners alike to put, from now on, youth employment at the forefront of their agenda, investments, and policy. The youth employment challenge and potential solutions are becoming better understood. And many governments in Africa nowadays recognize that youth employment cannot longer be regarded as a site priority, but it needs to be systematically considered, estimated, measured, and evaluated in all future investment policies and programs in the continent. In other words, maximizing and mainstreaming employment impact, particularly for young African women and men, needs to be at the heart of our collective efforts. The recently launched Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transition is a prime example of such required transformation and mentality shift. It aims at channeling national and international public and private investment into social protection for the 4 billion people who fall outside any existing coverage and to create at least 400 million decent jobs. Another prime example of that is the current ILO, um, African Development Bank project I am managing, consisting of developing a jobs marker for the bank and hopefully later for its partner country. This job marker coined by my regional director for Africa, Mrs. Cynthia Samuel Halong-Junyong, as a game changer, ambition to enhance employment impact by integrating employment consideration to the bank operation, and thus making sure that the bank financial instrument all contribute to decent job creation. Last but not least, at the policy level, governments, employers and worker delegates from 181 countries adopted the global call to action for a human-centered recovery at the International Labour Conference of June 2021. This call to action commit countries to work for an economic and social recovery that is fully inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. And it called for policies that prioritize the creation of decent job for all with specific measures to promote quality employment and economic development, worker protection, universal social protection and social dialogue, and to address inequality. Unfortunately, fiscal and other policy response we have observed so, so far in the regions have not been sufficient to enable this human-centered recovery. But the impact of the recession should be, I hope, for all of us, a wake-up call. Finally, my last recommendation is directed towards evalua evaluation colleagues, as I guess many of you today are working in a field of the evaluation. I believe it is the right time for us to take an honest and frank look and review at what we have been doing so far and what we have achieved in terms of maximizing employment impact, as well as our results to date in terms of reducing the informal economy and reducing inequality. 
which I have to say are not satisfactory. I would argue that our efforts, program and project have been rather fragmented. And there is an urging need for profound structural transformation, as well as coordinating actions on at least three levels. The first one by implementing at the country level, the strategy on inequality and the world of work, resulting from the conclusion adopted at the 109 International Labor Conference in order to tackle inequality, boost skills and lifelong learning. This strategy entails combining and coordinating action in several, several areas, promoting employment creation, fostering equal opportunity, accelerating the transition to formality, ensuring gender equality and non-discrimination, promoting equality, diversity and inclusions, realizing universal social protection, and finally promoting and develop the, the promoting trade and development for fair globalization. Reducing inequality is a matter of choice, but the cost of inaction is increasing by the day. The COVID crisis has highlighted in many cases further deepened some of these pre-existing inequalities as we've seen it and making countries less resilient to respond and to adapt to crisis or to future crisis. The economic and social cost of inaction is in many places increasing by the day. Acting against inequality has therefore become a matter of urgency and the clock is ticking. Secondly, by rethinking macroeconomic policies, towards pro-employment macroeconomic framework. Hence leveraging the use of monetary, fiscal and exchange rate instruments to create a policy environment that is conducive for economic growth and decent employment creation while maintaining macroeconomic stability. And thirdly, by testing innovative and alternative approach, as well as renewed partnership, aiming at piloting and hopefully scaling up youth-led, community-based and decentralized initiative in line with the prevailing African mentality, tradition, culture and cortex of solidarity. To conclude, I would like to summarize my four recommendations, which derive from the Abidjan Declaration, Advancing Social Justice, Shaping the Future of Work in Africa. Essentially, we need to build on a human-centered approach and make sure that decent work becomes a reality for Africa's young men and women, while substantially reducing inequality. And this is not just a statement, but I hope a shared, a shared recognition that African countries do embark on much needed structural transformation for better employment outcomes. Hopefully, this recession will trigger a paradigm shift and bring forward innovative, alternative, and endogenous African youth-led solutions. Finally, I would like to quote the African Development Bank president, Dr. Akiwuni Adesina, speaking at the NEPAD at 20 symposium, as a way at the same time to also thank the bank and the colleagues from the banks who have organizing this event, he said, and I quote, the youth are not the future of Africa, but the present of Africa. And what Africa does with its youth will determine the future growth of this continent. This, in my view, summarizes it all. Thank you. I uh, uh, will just uh, uh, go uh, through the four recommendations, empowering African youth uh, and promoting investment in the collection and analysis of statistics so that we have informed decision making. You've also talked about uh, rethinking macroeconomic frameworks and uh, having inclusive policies uh, for uh, youth employment 
and as well as social protection uh, so that we are able to uh, address uh, inequalities and fragility. You've also talked about uh, decent uh, jobs and uh, ensuring uh, that uh, there is the requisite investment in Africa. And the fourth recommendation that you made would be to draw lessons and uh, implement as well as uh, fast uh, track uh, initiatives so that we reduce inequalities. So those are the four key recommendations uh, coming out of your keynote speech and which will be discussed further by the panelists. We will uh, talk about uh, decent jobs on the continent and a uh, human-centered approach to the future of work for African youth, as well the substantial reduction of inequalities distinguished participants. I would now like to uh, begin the roundtable this discussion that uh, will discuss evaluative evidence on inclusive growth, youth entrepreneurship and employment perspectives in Africa. I will underscore the objective of this session, which is uh, to uh, draw uh, inspiration uh, from uh, human and social development and discuss practical impl implications and solutions for regional member countries and development partners. We'll also uh, try to see how evaluations contribute to a better understanding of what worked and what did not work and why. This is the final session of the AFDB Evaluation Week 2022. And uh, we are honored to have four panelists. In addition to David, we are happy to welcome Mr. Tapera Jeffrey, who is uh, the AFDB coordinator of the Jobs for Youth in Africa. We also have the pleasure to welcome Ms. Chido Cleopatra Mpemba, who is the African Union Special Envoy on Youth, and uh, Sajilu Kamwendo, who's the Head of Outcome and Impact Evaluation at the MasterCard Foundation. I uh, would like to uh, introduce them. I know that many of you know that uh, Mr. Tapera is uh, the coordinator for jobs for youth in Africa strategy, um, Africa Development Bank uh, Group. He is passionate about investing in youth and private sector development for green, resilient and inclusive economic growth and decent uh, jobs. He has over 20 years of experience and uh, he wants to ensure uh, that uh, he coordinates uh, the Jobs for Youth in Africa strategy to equip 50 million young people and create 25 million jobs by 2025 through integration, innovation, and investments across all the bank's high five priorities. He oversees the bank's human capital development investment portfolio in West Africa and Nigeria. He is a mathematics, marketing, and business leadership graduate from universities in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Switzerland. Our second panelist is Ms. Mpemba, who was appointed by the chairperson of the African Union Commission as the youngest diplomat in the chairperson's cabinet to lead on youth affairs in the member states of the African Union. In addition to this, she has uh, uh, been an advisor uh, to the minister in Zimbabwe, and uh, she's also been a member of the Global Leader Council uh, 
is co-chaired by the UNICEF Executive Director and the PwC Global Chairman. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Mr. Sajilu Kamwendo, who has over 15 years experience in monitoring, evaluation, reporting, and learning in international development and humanitarian emergencies, working with international non-governmental organizations. Earlier this year, he joined the MasterCard Foundation as Director of Outcome and Impact Evaluation. He has worked in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Southern Africa, and West Africa. He has been managing the MERL processes in multi-country and multiple sectors, including humanitarian emergencies, food security, cash transfers, wash, nutrition, early literacy, child protection, and adolescent programming. Mr. Sajilu has a keen interest in advancing evaluation that focuses on resilience, equ equity, and sustainability, leading to transformed systems and institutions. Without further ado, I would uh, begin by uh, requesting uh, the panelists in whichever order to take the floor and react to the keynote address that has just been made. Over to you, panelists. Um, acknowledging the presence of everyone who's joined us today, it's such an honor to be part of this panel and especially such a time when we have the largest demographic in Africa being the young people. In my reflection, um, you know, speaking about evalu the evaluations, what they tell us about interventions by countries and development partners to foster inclusive growth, youth entrepreneurship and employment. I believe that evaluations are highlighting the needs for countries and partners to amplify their efforts going beyond current levels of development. If we look at COVID-19, for example, it created a compounded effect on already existing challenges. And as a result, economic growth has declined and become less inclusive. If we break this down into four areas, number one on youth employment, one key area that being youth employment requires urgent amplified action. The 2021 African Economic Outlook projected that 20 to 30 million jobs will be lost by 2021 due to COVID-19. Whilst the ILO's 2020 report on Africa showed that one in five young people neither has a job nor is, is enrolled in education, employment or training. We see that the numbers are rising, noting that youth employment has been a global challenge for many years. And as the evaluation report suggests that this challenge is likely to be to, to be an order of magnitude higher in the years ahead. Therefore, countries and development partners must anticipate the African population growth and youth bulge, capacitate young people now for a better future. It will start with us helping to, to build the capacity in the potential that our young people provide. Not only that, but working very closely within countries um, and governments and policymakers in making this a reality for young people when it comes to job creation. It would take a holistic view of the private sector, the public sector, as well as young people themselves. Now, when we look at the future of work post the pandemic, the ILO's 2020 to 21 evaluative lessons on how to build a better future of work after the pandemic indicate that new priorities and drivers for change are needed. And these priorities include youth employment with young people, women, and the informally employed, especially in the agriculture sector. I believe there's so much potential there too. And as the most vulnerable, needing special support for their labor reinsertion, considering that they face the most impact as a result of COVID-19. When you look at the AFDB report, which, say, which, which, which indicates that while about 10 to 12 million youth enter the workforce each year, only about 3.1 million jobs are created, leaving vast numbers of youth unemployed. And yeah, we see the need to create new pathways for livelihoods, which is highlighted in the climate change sector, particularly green jobs is a key avenue as well for us to explore. When you look at the youth bulge, Africa's bulging population over 70% is a continental asset for driving regional wide economic development global marketplace participation, and overall continental resilience. 
Hence, it all requires governments and other development agencies to explore the optimal ways to respond to urgent human development needs and support long-term solutions that ensure that employment is increased and we do not see 28.7 million uh, more Africans sliding into extreme poverty, just like we saw in 2021. I think I will stop here for now and perhaps continue as we dialogue within this panel discussion, but to give my fellow panelists a chance to also intervene at this moment before I speak further. Thank you. Um, first, I fully agree that the issue of data uh, and information is critical. So we have to invest in labor market information systems uh, that gives us the power to make the right decisions in terms of policies and programs that are targeted. So that's the first thing. So fully agree with, uh, with, uh, with the speaker. The second point, uh, which is what we also strongly believe at the bank, young people are not a problem. Mm -hmm. Women are not a problem. Right? When we say that 75% uh, of the population is under the age of 35, right? When we say they will constitute half, a, half of 2 billion working age population by 2063, that's a huge resource. That's a very big basket full of energy, innovation, that's just waiting for, our, for us to cash in and get dividends. So we see that as an asset for the continent. We, we don't see that as a problem, uh, as, a, as a source of worry. We actually think that Africans must be proud that they, they have a huge resource, which is right in front of them, but only if the right policies and investments are made. That's only when you can get dividends from it. The unfortunate thing is if you don't invest, then you, you, you get the negative dividends which is what everybody talks about. But from our standpoint, this is a unique moment for the continent. Um, it's got a huge opportunity to really leap, leapfrog in terms of uh, development, if only the right policies and investments are made. So we fully agree that uh, young people are not the problem. They are actually part of the solution. Mr. Tapera, your two minutes are over. Uh, I'd now like to ask Mr. Sajilo to react for two minutes on David's keynote address. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, recognizing everyone who is part of this exciting uh, discussion. And thanks, David, for highlighting what I think is what is happening on our continent. And I'll pick from my fellow panelist, Tapera, uh, when he says youth are not the problem. I come from the MasterCard Foundation, and we've just recently launched our strategy called Young Africa Works, uh, which shows our commitment and our belief that youth in Africa have potential, youth in Africa should be contributing uh, to the economy and the development and growth of the continent. Uh, my remarks will focus on what uh, David emphasized on the transformation agenda, and I'll speak relating to what is happening in the field of evaluation and evidence. Uh, the shifts that we're calling for, yes, we want to measure the number of jobs, but more importantly, there has to be decent jobs. Uh, that's very, very important for us, really, what is the quality of jobs that we're looking at? Um, it's very, very important for us as evaluators. And how do we do that? Really, we want to bring in the youth to be part of that evaluation agenda and narrative of what a quality job looks like. And then the other point as well around transformation as we do evaluations, we just want to go beyond measuring numbers, but saying that uh, evaluations should focus on what is happening in the wider context we want to see shifts in policies, shifts in mindsets. So increasingly within the evaluation communities work, uh, looking at employment, youth employment in Africa, uh, really challenging ourselves to say, what are the systematic issues that we need to look at when it comes to employment? Uh, issues around resilience, issues around inclusion and equity are very, very important. And that's where really want to uh, push ourselves as the evaluation community. I'll stop here for now.
Thank you. I will now um, move on to the first question, which I'm going to ask Mr. Tapera to respond to. What do evaluations tell us about country and development partner interventions to foster inclusive growth, entrepreneurship, and youth employment in Africa? I think the first point I want to make is um, we have seen a lot of projects and uh, programs trying to address this issue. But unfortunately, projects and programs come to an end, they come and go. Their scale is also very, very limited. Just a few hundred people benefiting, the project is over. So we have seen a lot of uh, pockets of excellence in terms of projects. Uh, but however, the success is very mediocre uh, when you really compare it with the scale of the problem, uh, the scale of the challenge. So I think that uh, we've come to realize that it actually it's a systemic failure. It's an institutional gap uh, that, that, that we have to deal with in order to sustain job creation on the continent. It is not something that can be uh, addressed by a project that comes and goes and benefits a few people uh, in a particular locality. Uh, we all celebrate that we have, we have reached 50,000 people, et cetera. We, we're talking of a challenge in the range of millions. Uh, and, and therefore, we, we really need institutions uh, to, to resolve this issue. Um, that's, that's, that's the first point. Uh, that, that we are observing. So very good projects, very good pilots, you know, uh, mediocre success, but nothing really at scale uh, that, that, that is really benefiting young people. So sometimes you hear people saying, you know, these projects have failed. It's because we, they are living behind millions of young people who are actually not benefiting at all. So, so when you analyze, we do the evaluation of those projects, you, you suddenly realize that actually it's an institutional failure. Uh, we, we, you know, there's ecosystem gaps, systemic issues that need to be addressed in a more integrated fashion, rather than through small projects here and there, which are disconnected uh, and, 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 and not uh, harmonized uh, towards a single goal. So I, I think that that, that, that issue is, uh, is, is very important. Um, the, the second point I want to make is also that um, uh, the continent has been exporting jobs. I mean, you talked about 0.41% uh, 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 in terms of employment elasticity of 0.41. Uh, what that simply means is that we have experienced jobless growth for over a decade. Uh, and so we are exporting jobs and then paying for food, goods, and services that we can produce locally. Uh, and this is why when elephants fight, Africa is the grass that suffers uh, because, because basically we have a problem. So, so the answer to that is to increase local investments, the local content part of our investments and, and value chains and production functions. Really, we need to focus on that. Uh, and and um, I would say, for instance, um, if we have cobalt, why not uh, produce uh, the batteries for electrical vehicles? You know, if we have gold, why not produce the wedding rings and jewelry locally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we have cocoa, why not produce the chocolate? So we've been exporting jobs, and, and I think we really need to seriously look at the value chains in Africa, mm -hmm. take advantage of the Africa free continental uh, trade area as one big market, make sure we have the human resources protocol that allows our young people and, and, and everyone in Africa to work anywhere without restrictions, uh, so that we can really create a very significant market, uh, localize all the value chains and, and bring back the jobs that we've been exporting. Mm -hmm. the last I would like to ask you the following question. How does the AFDB take into account evaluation um, results when looking at youth employment strategies? So at the bank, we take evaluations uh, very seriously. Um, they inform the design of all our projects. So for every project that is closed and evaluated, the next one that is designed is actually based on the lessons uh, learned and good practices from, from that project. 
So some of the experience we are sharing with you now comes from our evaluation. Uh, and uh, what, 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 what we are seeing is that uh, we need to uh, form an integrated approach uh, when, when, when we are designing uh, our programs and projects. Because like I said, we have seen that in individual projects here and they are not working and we need institutional solutions. So we're currently working on institutional solutions when it comes to investing in youth entrepreneurship, uh, because we, we believe, of course, that uh, we do not want to turn the entire continent into a dormitory of workers. Uh, that, is, that is definitely what we do not want to do. We want entrepreneurship because our private sector has been very small. Uh, my colleague uh, Chido talked about only 4 million jobs on the market, so we don't have enough jobs. The private sector is too small. It's not industrialized enough. It's generating very few former jobs. And so entrepreneurship becomes very key. Uh, but to address that, we really need institutional solutions at scale uh, that can really drive and provide the incentives uh, for entrepreneurship on the continent to become one of the solutions on, uh, on job creation. So basically, we've been building uh, from our evaluations um, to identify exactly where the challenge is um, and what are some of the best practices uh, with our partners to move forward on that uh, mm -hmm. and accelerate job creation. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Tapera, for that additional information. I'd now like to move on to Ms. Mpemba. What we learn about the most effective policies, strategies, and interventions to harness the demographic dividend in Africa? Um, as I was uh, mentioning that, I think the first and foremost, youth inclusion is an ingredient of effectiveness. I mean, the evaluations and many more initiatives continue to shed light on one key area, that the most effective policies are inclusive of youth. And the African population is rapidly expanding, standing a little of over 1.4 billion, as mentioned below before, uh, you know, making up the estimated 16% of the total world's population. And with young people forecasted to constitute close to the billion of the continent by 2050. So this means that Africa's youth uh, making up half of the continent's population must be at the core of Africa's economic growth and inclusive development strategies. And we need to harness on the potential that young people bring, including on innovation. Secondly, Africa youth taking a leading role in harnessing the demographic dividend. We need to ensure that Africa's youth are at the forefront, um, you know, and ensure that we incorporate them to lead on this as well. Um, you know, just to give a few examples as informed with our African Union Development Agency new partnership for Africa's development recently launched, the Energize Africa Initiative. And this is a practical initiative and continental platform of youth, professionals, institutions, and facilities to fast track capacity mobilization strengthen innovative solutions, skills development, employment, and entrepreneurship. So such initiatives take a holistic and inclusive approach to the youth employment issue, prioritizing youth, and this is precisely what the continent needs to harness, the demographic dividend. And thirdly, I'll say youth-centered policies and interventions that are key to effectiveness of policies and strategies. Um, you know, for example, we've also seen um, the Jobs for Youth in Africa strategy launched by AFDB. And uh, for such a strategy, AFDB highlighted some strategic interventions to achieve the targets. And um, integration is one of those interventions. It entails applying a youth employment focus across bank projects, investments, and work with regional member countries. This inclusive growth by expanding economic opportunities for all youth uh, irrespective of gender, of age, socioeconomic strata, and geography uh, is, is very vital. And, you know, I'd also say skills training initiatives. I um, mean, we're also learning from evaluations of the importance of future response strategies, such as skills initiatives, jobs for the future, skills training coupled with informed market realities are also very important and continuity and durability of policies. They need to align to where we are in the market. We also need to learn the most effective policy solutions and initiatives that are durable. I mean, um, there's so many examples that I could give, but I guess for the sake of time, uh, you know, just, you know, 
showing that young people are able to secure first time and subse quick subsequent employment opportunities leading to their own businesses and entrepreneurial ventures is very important. And the roles of public employment services in coordinating and delivering those interventions is also very important. Furthermore, we cannot bypass the critical role played by public em employment services in coordinating and delivering interventions to support labor market recovery and the importance of public-private partnerships explored in various ev evaluation of projects um, in, in, in Commonwealth of Independent States too. And um, I believe just in summary, there are vast lessons to learn uh, and focus must remain on addressing these evolving youth needs together with inclusivity, human capital development and maximizing the job creation and the pool and potential that we have in young people. Yeah. Merci beaucoup, Madame Pemba. Uh, J'allais juste uh, uh, m'attarder un peu sur la question. Thank you very much indeed. I wanted to focus uh, uh, on a single issue, but we'll refer to it maybe. Without further ado, over to Mr. Jello. The question to what extent young people take advantage of uh, new opportunities stemming from new technologies. And what is your take on access to fairness or, or with respect to fairness as regards access to technology? Yes. Uh, so I'll respond to this question really by reflecting on an evaluation that the MasterCard Foundation uh, recently concluded across seven countries in East and West Africa, uh, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on life and job prospects uh, for young people. Uh, technological advancements and um, digitalization in general has to um, a good extent, I would say, uh, contributed to growth or a driver in job opportunities for the youth. Um, I'll give examples. Uh, we have digital platforms that have expanded employment opportunities. You talk of e-payments, you talk of uh, improved access to finance uh, through technology. Uh, reliable logistics uh, as well is one thing that we've seen as well um, as driving new opportunities. But during COVID as well, we saw digitalization uh, giving people access to new markets and uh, giving them also a chance to continue doing business when uh, the world was closing down because of the pandemic. Uh, the digital technology as well give uh, youth access to skills. So youth across the continent now have a widened access to training opportunities. Um, you talk of business development skills as well. Um, let's say youth is involved in agriculture, for example, they can get extension services uh, using digital platforms as well. And then we also, um, in our evaluation at least, saw a growth in other uh, skills like um, coding, which you can do from your home, but you have a global market um, or the business process outsourcing as well. One area that um, is uh, really driving employment, even the creatives. Um, Africa is a very creative continent. So uh, creatives putting their content on digital platforms is another area of uh, expanding opportunities. Um, having said that, um, to what extent I will uh, briefly talk as well of what we're learning from evidence as challenge as far as um, uh, digitalization is concerned. I think uh, my fellow panelists, Chilo and Tapera spoke about what you call systematic or policy level issues that need to be tackled. Uh, so in Africa, the basic things like access and affordability to data and devices is still an issue. In fact, um, smartphone penetration, while internet penetration might be high by internet, but a smartphone, which will enable you to fully maximize uh, employment opportunities is very, very low. Uh, the other thing as well is that beyond access to digital uh, technologies or advancement, there is some business skills that our youth still need to grow in terms of 
critical thinking, marketing. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do that. And then um, from an evaluation perspective as well, I think going forward, really, we want to amplify evidence that talks about what systematic shifts do we need to make, things like access to technology, uh, things like data prices, things like electricity, which might seem simple, but is a barrier to access. And we also see that young women um, have the least, young women in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, have the least access uh, to digital technology as well. So evaluation going forward really should spotlight and highlight what systematic shifts need to be done really so that we fully optimize um, technology and digitization to drive job growth uh, within Africa. I thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much. And now about fairness, the issue of fairness. What about it? Yes, uh, the issue of fairness or equity is very, very key when you talk of uh, digital technology. Uh, like I said, um, globally, um, youth in Africa, young women and men, have the least access um, to digital technology, also in terms of the quality of work. While unemployment, I think Mark, David, sorry, had a good point to say, while we might look at the unemployment rate is at 11%, I think it's because they cannot afford not sit at home, otherwise there will not be food on the table. So they end up doing low quality uh, jobs or jobs that are very dangerous and uh, not really fulfilling. Uh, so, but going back again uh, to what evaluation can do. So evaluation really is around challenging systems, challenging uh, policies, challenging mindsets that are providing or proving to be barriers or could be opportunities as well to unlock employment opportunities for all. Um, when we say inequality, I'm thinking of young women, I'm thinking of refugees and displaced people across uh, the continent or those really who are living in uh, conflict zones, but also we're thinking about climate change, which is going to, not going to, but is already currently affecting people's livelihoods. Those involved in agriculture are seeing a lot of challenges as well. So really when you talk of inequality and evaluation, we really want to spotlight at systems, uh, policies, mindsets that really affect and could potentially address issues of inequality or uh, equity. Thank you. We're going to move to the last question. I, what role can the FDB play from the angle of your institute? Yeah. What are the main focus areas uh, the bank should include in its next 10 year strategic plan? And uh, I think that each one of this should take two minutes, not more, to answer this point in the interest of time. David, please. I think I already gave uh, four um, initial thought or key recommendations, but perhaps I will give uh, just an additional one. Um, us at ILO, um, the backbone of what we do is the Abidjan Declaration. And um, fairly unique at ILO through tripartism and social dialogue, our leitmotiv is really on, I've described it already, but, it, but it's on this human-centered approach. And um, I think this is perhaps the, the this recommendation that I would do to the bank, that I would like to give to the bank is really, and I know they are doing it already, but to really embrace this human-centered approach, and that means many things, as I explained before, but that also means investing in the long term on human capital development. So that is also just this additional point that I wanted to make, um, um, and I'll, I give the floor to my uh, colleagues now. Merci beaucoup, David. C'est un seul point, mais très, très, très important. La consistance dans l'investissement. Et, 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 et je pense que c'est une discussion qu'on ne pourra pas évacuer ici. It is, uh, just one point that's very important. That's in human capital. We can't uh, really discuss the matter now, but uh, uh, the floor is yours, Mrs. Denver. 
Uh, but I was saying, I think uh, in, in my regard, I'd uh, you know, be biased towards youth, anything youth related, um, given that that's the constituency that I represent in Africa. But playing that role to mobilize young people regarding opportunities that become available. And also not forgetting the marginalized communities, not everyone has access to information, not everyone has access to digital platforms, but ensuring that everyone is included, leaving no one and no place behind. But beyond the mobilization of youth, advocacy is also very important and plays a critical role within um, the African Union, specifically having the opportunity and access um, to dialogue with member states and policymakers that represent um, the, 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 the countries within the African Union, but continuously playing that role. Um, I know that, um, you know, as, 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 as mentioned previously, I think in February at our um, AU summit is, um, you know, the, the developments that are to follow with AFDB, um, you know, on the Youth Enterprise Investment Bank Initiative. And, um, you know, as the African Union, as well as the Office of the Chairperson Youth Envoy, you know, we're always ready to collaborate uh, in the advocacy of adoption of the Youth Enterprise Investment Bank Initiative across our member states. I believe this will institutionalize Africa's commitment to support youth enterprise and provide a platform to facilitate access to finance in an underserved niche market. And um, lastly, just in summary, uh, prioritizing climate financing for Africa. Um, I believe that first and foremost, the AFDB could play a role in raising new climate finance for Africa. Indeed, new and innovative financing mechanisms to provide um, loans for green financing and foreign direct investment, FDIs, that are ever more critical um, in summary. And AFCTA, as well as quota-led financing allocations that are inclusive of the youth. Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Shaliju, you have two minutes. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Really, two recommendations are for me. Um, number one is around resilience, which is a theme as well for uh, this week. Um, we will have a lot of crises ahead of us as well, a lot of shocks. In fact, we're experiencing them. And then when it comes to youth employment, we'll take a knock, which might result in youth losing or us losing all the investments that we've made. So we really need to understand and appreciate the concept of resilience moving forward. How do we keep our young women and young men employed when and the next shock happens? And then the second shift really that, um, and I think uh, AFTP is considering, um, Tapira spoke of it really saying that we need to move from small programs and projects, but to large scale so really investing in systematic shifts which means we're looking at policies we're looking at barriers we're looking at mindsets and really unlocking all the potential looking at integration across the continent how do we really leverage that as well to grow and drive our youth employment so really a move away from fragmentation a move away from time-bound programs but to look at a greater transformation a greater systematic shifts in how we approach our initiatives and investments in job creation. Thank you. Uh, I am really smiling uh, from what I'm hearing from our panel members. Um, it gives us confidence that uh, the discussions we are having for, for the next uh, strategy of the bank are in line with the sentiments that they're expressing. So I, I think uh, for us to in, in, to have that rapid, inclusive, resilient, uh, green economic growth that, that creates jobs, um, we need to have an empowered population. So I, I can't agree more that uh, investments in human capital, uh, you know, the knowledge, the skills, the jobs, and the health that uh, people need in order to unlock their potential has to be at the center of, of what we do. Uh, and, and I think that that is going to also be very much be at the center of the next strategy uh, of the bank, uh, among other things. Um, also, I think that uh, uh, the issue of access to finance, particularly for young uh, or youth entrepreneurs, uh, is very key. Uh, but finance alone is not enough. Uh, so we have to take a systemic and integration integrated approach uh, to make sure we have the right policies. Uh, we have the technical assistance for capacity building. Uh, we also de-risk other players that have the resources, but they look at them as a very high risk uh, asset class. And, and so we, we need to de-risk and incentivize them to play their part. 
but at the same time, we need to invest directly into them. And, and, and this is what we are building here at the Africa Development Bank, working with a number of countries to really institute this in countries uh, to mobilize resources, to be able to uh, have such institutions, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving at scale and systemically uh, uh, to address this issue on, on job creation. So I think from my part, I, I can only echo uh, what, what my colleagues on the panel have said. Uh, thank you very much. Now, we're going to open it up to questions and answers. But before that, I think that uh, some questions are already in the chat. I'm going to summarize them and uh, each one of you will try to answer the question and then we'll take a new series of questions. First uh, question is to tap in. What are the strategies and plans that the FTB develops to help African uh, countries revitalize their economies, particularly the sec private sector? And second question, uh, still to Mr. Aten, what are the strategies the bank has uh, implemented to uh, promote self-employment in Africa. I think that both questions are related. Uh, as you know, the bank uh, invests both in public and private sector uh, institutions. Uh, and, and, and so it's not just a bank for, for the public sector, it also invests in the private sector. Uh, especially that in my case, uh, 80 to 90 percent of jobs are created in the private sector. So the private sector becomes very key. Um, and uh, we have the private sector development strategy at the bank, uh, which is uh, which is uh, shaping our investments in uh, in private sector. Uh, we have a private sector uh, and uh, industrialization complex. Uh, so we actually have a vice president. Uh, responsible for private sector development, uh, industrialization, and industrialization at the bank. Uh, so we are very, very serious on private sector investments. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give specific examples, but we are investing uh, in Africa's private sector. Uh, we do have also special initiatives. For example, our uh, special agro-industrial industrialization uh, economic zones, uh, our, our SAPZs, uh, Special Agro uh, Industrial uh, Processing Zones. Uh, these are, you know, government enabled, private sector led huge operations uh, that are often uh, centered around key sectors of the economy, uh, for example, the agricultural sector. And, and here we invest heavily uh, for job creation through private sector development. Um, so just to uh, to put that emphasis that the bank invests both in the public sector as well as in the uh, private sector. And we, we do have a, a whole team and a series of investments uh, geared uh, for that. Um, and this also includes banks, the financial sector. We're very active in, in that as well. Uh, we do have extend, for example, uh, letters of credit to a number of financial institutions on, on the continent to be able to extend uh, financial services uh, to, to our people. So we're very, very active in that space. Uh, when, when it comes to, um, uh, to jobs, uh, we, we have a very specific and deliberate strategy, uh, the Jobs uh, for Youth in Africa strategy, uh, to create 25 million jobs by 2025 and empower 50 million young people. Uh, to that, we are about 12.1, just under uh, half of those jobs already delivered. And we're getting hungry, we, we're getting excited, and we think a lot more can be done uh, because that, that contribution is simply a drop uh, in the ocean. So we, we, we're gearing ourselves to accelerate the implementation of that strategy and, uh, and, and try to see if we can deliver a lot more uh, in terms of uh, job creation. So thank you very much. The next one is uh, directed to Mr. Pamba. Um, what are the skills and competencies that bureaucrats, planners, and evaluators need to have to ensure youth inclusiveness and youth-led planning and evaluation processes? 
let me repeat it again. What are the skills and competencies that bureaucrats, planners, and evaluators need to have to ensure youth inclusive and youth led planning and evaluation processes? Okay, um, thank you for that. I think first and foremost, um, as previously mentioned by the, uh, the previous panelists, we need to take a human-centered approach. And when you take a human-centered approach, again, then it puts the young people at the center of the decisions that we make. Again, we also need to take an approach of being inclusive and being open to creativity. Uh, you know, cre creativeness that comes with the young people and innovation that comes with the young people. I mean, we're living in various generations. As you're aware that we have the millennials, we have the Gen Z, which is very different to, um, you know, our previous generation. I mean, I'll give an example for one. Previously, before I joined this role, I worked in the bank for seven years within risk management. And um, what I found was, what worked was that inclusiveness that came to say, you know, there's a young person and, uh, you know, they had a graduate program, a leadership uh, graduate program that was in place that you know made sure that there were room and there was quotas for young people to form part of the management um you know committee and as well as the, the the leadership within the structures in the bank that i worked for the international bank that i worked for and i believe that it would take that management style one that is very inclusive very open-minded and also open to learn from the young people because there's so much that we can also learn from you know the younger generation in terms of what they've been exposed to technology wise and innovation wise to where the world um, it's going towards and um, being able to dialogue communication amongst one another, intergenerational dialogues, like co-leadership and co-designing is very crucial. And I think it's a really been skill that we all require, not only um, for our leaders, but for ourselves as well as young people, we also need to we require that skill to be able to dialogue across generations and be able to co-lead and co-design the future that you know we ensure the development of Africa. Um, Mr. Salihu, the question is the one. In terms of evaluation, the lack of data is partly due to the non-cooperation between the many initiatives and lack of some indicators to document in a sort of dashboard. How can we move forward and have a dashboard on impact on youth employment that's disaggregated? Let me repeat it again. In terms of evaluation, the lack of data is partly due to the non-cooperation between many initiatives and lack of some indicators to document in a sort of dashboard. How can we move forward to have a dashboard on impact on youth employment that's disaggregated? One of the things that uh, we are grappling with uh, in the community of evaluators is data around employment. Um, Employment, just defining what is employment is one of the biggest challenges you have, especially in our continent where there is a high degree of informality or people can take up multiple jobs because they are underemployed. So just estimating uh, the number of people that are employed is a big challenge. Uh, so what are we doing? Some of the things that are in discussion really is around, yes, we want to um, harmonize um, measurement, how employment is measured across. I think ILO would um, be a leader in this in terms of employment statistics, but um, from our end as a foundation as well, what we have done when it comes to employment statistics, um, just to echo what Chido said, um, we want the youth to define what employment means. So when you are talking about a dashboard of employment, we're talking about meaningful employment as well. Um, we want the youth to be part of that. So it's not going to be a dashboard that is going to show you the numbers, but we want narratives that go with that as well. Um, when I say narratives, really to say, when I'm fully employed, when I'm getting fully employed, what does it mean for you, me as a youth in terms of my well-being? So beyond numbers to say how many have been employed, we want to go beyond as well in evaluation when we're tracking this to say, what does it mean for the youth? Is it meaningful employment? Is it gainful employment? Is it sustained employment as well? Um, so we're looking at all that. Um, yes, there are efforts. We trying to construct a narrative that can be used across the continent. It's not easy, uh, but yeah, we're trying among the community of evaluators. Um, on the question of data, uh, many things has been said, but uh, I think first uh, there is the issue of 
anonymized data. So there are different definitions across different countries. So obviously, if you want to start comparing or uh, having a, a good um, data set, you need to have the same definition. So that's why I said before, we need to start having harmonized definition within country and also within um, development partners in different banks. And the second thing perhaps on the data issue is uh, uh, that very often um, data is seen not as a priority, there's other priorities, you know, there are education, of course, and many others. Uh, but um, the, what, what the problem is that usually um, because the data is outdated or not there, it's very hard to actually make evidence-based uh, policies without any data or without dated data. So this is basically one of the issues. And yes, very often I've seen it in many countries when we start talking about statistics and data, it's, it, it really falls at the towards the end of the priorities. But although I think it should actually come up because it's with the data that we can actually and government can uh, design and implement meaningful pro-employment policies. And I think that the next questions uh, go to Mrs. Pemba, and it is about the evidence, what kind of evidence we have with regard to job creation uh, in the field of uh, uh, African integration. Uh, what lesson can we draw from this? Uh, okay, so I think I'll just tackle this question for more for a holistic um, view in terms of do you have evidence. I think we do, whilst there's so much that can still be done in this development, but I think we do have um, some examples to what has worked. For example, we've seen even across um, Africa, one way that we've been able to provide that employment or strengthen entrepreneurial um, initiatives within African context and the youth has been with accelerator programs. Um, you know, just recently as well, there's an accelerator program that was launched that has to do with AFCTA and how young people can, um, you know, be able to trade um, across um, the continent. And again, this gives an opportunity for young people as well to be able to fully, um, you know, realize when it comes to their business initiatives, as well as uh, creating employment within that scope too was having access to funding and that's something that's also creative and has been robust in providing that solution um, another example that i could also give um, you know in addition to this is uh, if we look at for example green jobs and climate change even as we head towards cop 27 uh, we've seen uh, quite a number of initiatives one that um, even within um, the office of the youth envoy we've been able to get involved in facilitating which has been in terms of you know innovative um, um, awards and challenges that are going to go towards young people to be able to um, invest in their uh, business ideas that have to do with um, climate mobility and resilience too. I found that um, that has worked. Uh, in terms of job creation, in terms of employment, um, I think, again, we're still faced with the challenge of how we match, um, you know, the current skills that are required within the job market and our education system and i think that would then take an approach where we have to look at it from a systematic view and you know being able to review in terms of one the education sector number two within the organizations in the private sector how they can make um jobs available for the youth and be able to create those jobs more sustainable mr tapera what are the lessons from program like your for youth in countries such as malawi how did AFDB measure impact? In, in Malawi, we, we actually have a, a jobs for youth in, uh, in Malawi uh, project um, that, that we designed for, 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 for young people in, uh, in Malawi. And uh, this program was looking at skills development um, as, a, as a tool for both uh, preparing for employability as well as for entrepreneurship. Uh, so what what we we learned from that project is 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 that um, uh, it's important to look at both right uh, self employment and employability. Um, so employability is key where jobs are available, whereas self employment uh, is also in itself uh, you know a way to resolve unemployment because you reduce the number of job seekers uh, by promoting entrepreneurship. Uh, and then entrepreneurship in turn creates jobs for those who are still seeking jobs. So that, those, those are some of the lessons that we, we are learning from Malawi. Uh, the second one is uh, 
issues of access to the the right policies very important uh you know and incentives so it's not just about policy it's also about incentivizing uh young people to uh, to get into the market so that's one of the projects where we are deriving uh, some of our lessons for future designs of uh, programs and, and projects what questions should evaluation ask to inform the impl implementation of youth employment intervention as the desired scale right so you know the the impact is very important i i think one of the areas where we haven't invested enough is impact evaluations mm -hmm. um and i think we we tend to look at monitoring and evaluation systems during project implementation but uh, very few development partners uh really look at impact evaluation so we can really learn more on what works and what doesn't uh and uh, of course i'm aware that uh, there are various methodologies some of them quite costly uh, but nonetheless i think it's uh, it's important uh in project design to reserve some resources for impact uh, evaluation and 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 that really gives us uh, you know the evaluation uh, uh you know outcome that can help us in really designing some of these programs uh in in a much better way Thank you, Tapera, and it's still for you, unfortunately, but this is uh, at least uh, a point that the job for youth strategy is very important for, the, for our audience. What strategy is the African Development Bank putting in place now to redress the situation so as to enable small and medium-sized enterprises to improve and recover? their losses and create more opportunity for the employment of youth in Africa, which has grown to a very alarming proportion. Yes, so uh, the, the bank uh, invested heavily in, in the COVID response uh, program that we put in place immediately uh, on the onset of COVID-19. Uh, part of that was actually to save enterprises from co collapsing. Uh, including uh, the small and medium enterprises. So we invested quite uh, heavily in uh, COVID response uh, operations that were actually targeted at enterprises, uh, particularly small and medium enterprises, um, to avoid going bust. Uh, and, and, and so they, they, through those programs, uh, they were covered uh, in, in a number of ways, uh, including uh, you know, uh, putting aside some of the loans that they were holding uh, for a certain period, uh, you know, uh, giving them grace periods uh, to allow them to uh, to swim across the uh, pandemic, if I can say that now that it's coming to an end. Um, and uh, also to bring in new types of enterprises that are more res resilient. So. Uh, those resources were also geared at innovation uh, around the COVID-19, uh, uh, at the height of COVID-19. And we saw a lot of new enterprises coming on the market um, that were really responding to, uh, to the uh, pandemic in very innovative ways. Uh, we invested even in challenge funds uh, that challenged the young people to come up with solutions in their local communities uh, to respond to COVID-19, whether by manufacturing locally, for example, uh, you know, health-related uh, products and uh, or, or providing those services uh, using digital technology, for example, to reach people who are under quarantine. So a lot of small enterprises were formed at that time. Uh, many of them are still continuing uh, and, and, and using uh, their digital capabilities uh, to continue to provide services. So the COVID response uh, strategy of the bank uh, worked very well uh, in terms of preserving jobs, uh, but also creating new jobs, through new small and medium enterprises. Um, at this point, we are moving on now, looking at uh, recovery. Uh, so economic growth and, and recovery from the pandemic. And our focus is going to be uh, access to finance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is an area where, of course, the bank is uh, is a trusted financial partner and broker for, for the continent uh, for over a century. So we will use our comparative advantage to mobilize financial resources uh, to support uh, you know, uh, programs and uh, initiatives on access to finance. 
uh, as well as policy as usual, because we, we are an impartial convener on the continent uh, and also a genuine technical advisor, because uh, this is our continent and no one knows it better than ourselves. Uh, so all our solutions are homegrown. So we are very, very much at the center of uh, promoting recovery and growth. And so even our next strategy uh, will be focused on that. Now I'm going to shift to friends and uh, the next question is directed to uh, David. Uh, David, here's the question. In the case of Made in Africa, how is this sustained or supported? How is this contextualized in Africa when it comes to employment? There are several parts uh, or several response to this question. Uh, internally and um, within the um, within the ILO, we have a research department which look at this and which trying also via different research forum policy exchange, trying also to convince the different players to use harmonized definition and harmonized evaluation tools. Um, in terms of contextualizing these um, this to the African continent, this is very much something that we try to to do. Obviously, as I said also in my speech, uh, looking at you know an, an employment figures is not sufficient, uh, especially in terms of Africa. We need to look at also uh, different indicators and different uh, aspects such as. Uh, the informal uh, economy. So I think there's a lot of things that, which are being done. Uh, there's also a number of projects from the ILO and partners which look, for example, at um, employment impact assessment in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, and trying to actually conceptualize this and pick up what can be um, learned from this experience and later on, obviously, uh, build on. So th there's many, uh, I would say, initiative either internally within ILO or even with partners on the ground to actually do that. Okay, thank you very much, dear participants. Once again, we thank you for your active participation and for all these questions that you asked. And we thank you for the interest that you've shown for this session. The key messages that we take away from this session are the difficulty of investing in the information system uh, of the job market and also to assess the impact, which make it difficult for us to uh, advised in a, an adequate manner on the policies when it comes uh, to jobs for youth. It also appeared that uh, we have to put in place inclusive approaches for uh, jobs for youth and integrate the creation of jobs and accelerate the structural transformation of African economies. And in terms of uh, lessons learned on the basis of uh, what we've been able to discuss and the results that were uh, shown, we need not only to increase the volume of uh, investments, but uh, target these investments in order to improve job, jobs for youth uh, by opening markets. And in terms of uh, lessons learned as well, we talked about the necessity of increasing the efforts of uh, resource mobilization and targeted resource mobilization 
and we need to strengthen uh, our relationship with uh, policies uh, in terms of uh, jobs for youth, not only in terms of information, but also in terms of the relationship between employment and uh, the skills uh, by developing uh, the relationships uh, within the ecosystem. And now when it comes to recommendations, we had to, if we had to reformulate the key um, recommendations, uh, it would be the need to implement and accelerate a program uh, in order to, to reduce inequalities and, of course, uh, programs uh, that uh, uh, put together on the basis of uh, credible information. And uh, we would also need to improve the formulation of policies and improve the general framework of uh, uh, our action. We need to promote uh, solutions that have a real impact on the ground uh, in the areas of uh, youth employment and uh, the uh, social protection of the youth to, so that they can uh, be moved out of uh, informality and all this uh, in order to better prepare our societies for the future. And I think that uh, a summary, in summary, these are the main uh, points that uh, reflect the efforts of the bank uh, in order to promote uh, SMEs, uh, that is putting focus on uh, the financing and uh, putting in place investment banks. I will stop here and thank you very much for your kind attention. So, dear participants, we are coming to the end of this year's edition of Evaluation Week. Uh, now, rather than me trying to summarize all of the key perspectives, knowledge and ideas shared over the last three days, uh, we will have a graphic presentation instead. Uh, during each of our sessions, uh, Virginie Menot, a graphic illustrator, has been following the discussions and has created illustrations of the key points raised. So she will provide us with a short presentation of each of these illustrations and help us to recap what was discussed at Evaluation Week 2022. So let me introduce Virginie. She is a professional freelance illustrator based in France. Relying on exhaustive and technical data, she illustrates and formats content, both for print and web usage, from white papers and barometers to portraits and website illustrations. Virginie also holds an MBA in international marketing and has over 10 years of corporate experience in marketing, communication, and sales support in international environments. So Virginie, please go ahead and present to us your illustrations. So um, first, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to the Evaluation Week team for inviting me to um, illustrate all of these beautiful conferences. Um, well, I can say at the end of these three days, it has been full of rich uh, content. And um, as you mentioned, I offer to walk you through quickly the different illustrations that, that I've been making. <clears throat> so this is the first um, image from the very first session we had on day one, which was about the, um, the professional workshop for young and emerging evaluators. And I basically uh, tried to, um, you know, raise all the crucial points. And basically, there was the required steps for um, a good evaluation and also the more insight on the mixed method approached in um, the evaluation 
and also quite um, insightful um, resources that you can find online. And then um, there was a whole part of sharing experience and also um, to address what the experience evaluators were looking for when recruiting young evaluators. Um, then this was um, a very powerful opening uh, plenary session um, when we've been walked through the key challenges for African people and the continent and really how um, evaluation can help address them and all the importance of finding good evidence to really make the most appropriate decisions and what were the, um, the main challenges, but also opportunities for the continent and um, really the role of evaluation um, regarding accountability and learning in this process. Um, then there has been, again, um, a uh, very uh, interesting discussion, um, mainly around more practical ways to support evaluation in the countries and also the role uh, of the different governments and all the different stakeholders. And um, the importance to strengthen all the data collection and that the whole system supports um, this uh, uh, raising the evaluated knowledge to help the whole continent face the challenges. Day two was um, more about the different sectors. Uh, so the, the, during the morning uh, was addressed the, the sector of power in Africa and all the changes driven um, by the context. Um, that we are all uh, aware about, and uh, especially as well um, uh, the need for um, uh, a better infrastructure and all the work that has to be done both to generate uh, power but also to distribute it and all the different challenges that are coming through um, the need for, uh, for energy and the climate changes as well and how crucial as well um, it is to think of sustainability and um, the, the role of tarification being crucial to find the right balance be, um, between um, affordable prices for the population, but also sustainability for the different stakeholders in that field. Um, the afternoon was about agriculture and agricultural productivity which is a big concern um, on the continent. <coughs> Sorry. Um, again, with the different uh, shocks and impact of uh, COVID and uh, the conflicts and the climate changes, which have a direct impact on the, um, on the food access and uh, on poverty and all these challenges and needs for the population and for the farmers to access to better seeds and also to access to practical evidence and data, even in remote rural areas, and also all the support that people need um, in you know, meeting norms for international um, markets, for example, and how to bring that knowledge and um, that technology to people through financing and all kind of partnerships and um, uh, there was also the very interesting insight from the World Food Program evaluations and how uh, the evidence supports that um, humanitarian work can actually really help um, uh, maximizing this productivity of uh, agriculture. And then we moved to today, day three, and with this very interesting presentation this morning on debt burdens on the different um, economies of the different countries, sorry, and how um, you can manage the debt levels and especially uh, how you use uh, your level of debt to make sure that it's uh, used, uh, uh, that the spendings are used on the uh, appropriate things and that uh, you make sure that all the benefits of the resources you borrow are bigger than the costs and how you can uh, spend your funds more effectively and everything 
that can support um, and have a healthier debt management. And as for this afternoon, it's not quite uh, finished yet. I will need a few more minutes to, you know, put things around and uh, reorder some of the thoughts. But really was about um, uh, not to forget to put the human and the population at the center of all the economic decisions we are making and how um, a crucial um, challenge today for Africa is to involve uh, youth and women and all uh, vulnerable groups in actually building a sustainable uh, growth for the for the continent and how what could uh, at first sight maybe appear as a weakness is actually a greatest factor for um, sustainable growth and for a resilient um, continent. Thank you very much, uh, Virginie. Uh, I think you captured uh, all of the, the very rich discussions very well, which is uh, certainly not easy to do in uh, in real time. Uh, so we will certainly look forward to uh, to the final versions uh, of your illustrations. Uh, let me now bring this evaluation week to a close by thanking all of those uh, who were involved. Um, I would first of all like to sincerely thank all of the moderators, speakers, presenters, and panelists who contributed to each of the six sessions we've held over the past three days. We have learned a great deal from you about uh, tools and methodologies in the evaluation profession, the role of evaluation in tackling the key challenges facing Africa, improving sustainable access to reliable, affordable, and green energy, food security and agricultural productivity, Africa's debt burden and debt management practices, and human and social development, particularly as concerns the youth. Secondly, a special thank you to the organizing team led by Dieter Gijswerts and Jane Musumba, and all the session team members at IDEV and across other bank departments who have worked tirelessly to prepare the sessions and to run them smoothly to ensure that we have a successful event. Thirdly, all the colleagues who have been working behind the scenes, the video conference team, the interpreters, the Q&A monitors, rapporteurs, and many others supporting the logistics of the event. And finally, I'd like to give a warm thanks on behalf of the entire IDEF team and the African Development Bank family to all of you who joined our sessions throughout the week from all over the world. Thank you for your engagement, for your questions, for your views and experiences that you shared. Dear participants, this officially brings the 2022 edition of the African Development Bank Development Evaluation Week to a close. I hope that this evaluation week has provided you with new insights and a deeper appreciation of using evaluation to inform and help us build a more resilient Africa. All the event materials, including presentations, speeches, recordings, and Virginie's illustrations will be shared on the IDEF website. I sincerely hope that you will join us in 2024 for our next edition. Please take a few moments to fill out our survey. And thank you and have a great weekend. Goodbye, everyone.